So it is here, the official programme for the service at Westminster Abbey for Their Majesty's Coronation next Saturday. So if you want a copy, you can download it for free. If you go to churchofengland.org, you'll come up on this page. And if you scroll down, you will see here, you can download the programme. And here you can download the programme with commentary. And that's all for free. So you can follow the service and understand it, <laughs> what's happening next week. So as you can see, I've printed off my own copy um, and it's really fascinating to see what will happen because I've never seen a coronation uh, before. So if you have a look, it starts with lots of different processions. So we've got the procession of faith leaders, representatives from the Jewish, Sunni and Shia Muslim, Sikh Buddhist Hindu, Jain, Bayi and Zoroastrian communities which will take part in the procession into Westminster Abbey. So it's representing the multi-faith nature of our society and the importance of inclusion of other faiths whilst respecting the integrities of the different traditions. This is followed by the procession of ecumenical leaders which reflects the diversity and richness of the Christian church in the UK. And then we have the realms procession, so the national flags of the realms. These are the nations of which the majesty is head of state. So there's a total of 15. Then we have the choir procession. And then we have the procession of the king and queen. So this will be to an anthem of I was glad which has been used at the entrance of monarchs since at least 1626. So it's really, really very historical. And at this point, as the Queen and King arrive, they will be wearing their robes of state. So you may have seen this uh, image that has just been released, um, which shows the Royal School of Needleworks embroidery team conserving the king's robe of state. So the king's robe of state, it, robe of state is made of crimson velvet and was worn by King George VI at his coronation in 1937. Um, the velvet has been conserved by the Royal School of Needlework with the lining and gold lace conserved by Eden Ravenscroft. Now the Queen Consort, Her Majesty, will be wearing the robe originally made for Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. And that's again made out of crimson velvet. So there is then a greeting of the King and there has been a new inclusion where the King replies and this marks the tone of the service. So showing that the magnificence and beauty of the processions and costumes is a great celebration of tradition and joy, but behind the pageantry lies another message which the words and ceremonies to come will demonstrate, so that our king commits himself through prayers and oaths to follow the Lord he serves in a life of loving service in his role as monarch. There then follows a moment of silent prayer for their majesties. This allows for them to reflect, contemplate, and bring themselves in the coronation service before God, and it reflects the majesty's homage to God before any person pays homage to them. So then we have a greeting and introduction by the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, which sets out what is to take place and invites all those who participate, wherever they are, to share in a commitment to love and serve one another. There then follows a, a Kiri don't know if that's exactly how you say it. If anybody knows, do, do let me know. Um, but for this service, the Kiri has been commissioned to be sung in Welsh, which I think is a lovely addition to the service. It has been used for around 1,600 years. And we use it still to remind ourselves that no human being is perfect in their actions, thought and relationships. In other words, all have sinned. 
So we come to the first part of the first section of the ceremony called the recognition, which is the first element of the traditional English coronation rite. And it's become known as the recognition in medieval times. Though a version has been uh, alluded to um, for the coronation of King Ed Edgar back in 973 AD, can you believe it? So there are different declarations. So his majesty is presented to the people and they are given the opportunity to show their support. So the archbishop makes the first declaration facing the high altar. Then new to this coronation, you've got the subsequent declarations made by Lady of the Garter, representing the oldest order of chivalry in England, Lady of the Thistle, representing the oldest order of chivalry in Scotland, and the George Cross holder from the armed forces, chosen for their distinguished service and bravery. So that's a really lovely part of the ceremony. We then have the presentation of the Bible, which is the church's first gift to the king. So its presentation before any of the regalia reminds us all, as well as the king, that he is called to govern with good conscience in the sight of God. And the formal present presentation of the Bible dates back to the joint coronation of William the Second, sorry, William the Third and Mary the Second in 1689. And this was brought to the start of the service in 1953. And it was also in 1953 that the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland took part in the service for the first time. And this shows the symbolic progression and improvement of ecumenical relations and how as Christians we are united in our diversity under the word of God. There then follows the oath. So the wording before the oath explains that the Church of England seeks to foster an environment where people of all faiths and beliefs may leave, live freely. In the words of Her Late Majesty, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth II, gently and assuredly, the Church of England has created an environment for other faith communities and indeed people of no faith to live freely. So an oath or promise has been made by the monarch has always been part of the coronation rite. Um, in nine, 973, King Edgar's promise was to defend the church in peace to forbid extortion and crime and to be equitable and merciful in his judgments. And this King Edgar's promise largely was largely unchanged for 300 years. And then a fourth clause was added. In 1689, the oath was expanded for the joint coronation of William and Mary. And an invasion in this service is that the oath is preceded by a short paragraph in which the Archbishop reflects that the church will continue to seek to foster an environment where all people may live freely. And this reflects the words of Her Late Majesty in 2012 when she said, The concept of our established church is occasionally misunderstood and I believe commonly underappreciated. Its role is not to, to defend Anglicism, Anglicanism, to the exclusion of other religions. Instead, the church has a duty to protect the free practice of all faiths in this country. We then have a collect or a prayer which was written by the Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. And then we go on to the King's Prayer. So having fulfilled his legal and constitutional obligations to the nature and the realms, the King offers this and the vows he made to God in a prayer specially composed for his majesty to pray alone in response to the promises made. So this prayer continues to reflect the theme of loving service. It's inspired by biblical language and also the language of the much loved hymn, I vow thee to my country. So this is possibly the first time in our history that such a prayer has been voiced so publicly um, by the sovereign. So Gloria in Excelsis is one of the ancient songs of the church and based on the song of the angels at the birth of Jesus. So the Mass of Full Four Voices um, was written during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. 
And this Gloria comes from a mass setting um, composed for Roman Catholics. And it has been embraced into the central repertoire of many Anglican cathedrals. So, to pro so it provides a delicate simplicity and intimacy, which balances some of the grander and stronger pieces of music that will be heard through the service. We then have another collect which has been written specially for this service. And it continues to expand the themes of loving service, which are at the heart of the coronation celebrations. So the Prime Minister, Ricky Sunak, Rishi Sunak, sorry, will be invited to read. The epistle. Um, this has become a modern custom seen in other state ceremonies. As the Prime Minister, he's the, well, as he is the Prime Minister of the nation in which the coronation is taking place. We then have a gospel which is sung, and this music is a commission composed for this service. We then have the gospel of St. Luke, which is his account of Jesus' worship at the synagogue. Synagogue is a local place of Jew Jewish worship and teaching, and there are many in this country. And the language of anointing points to the most solemn element of the coronation service, when his majesty will himself be anointed and set apart for service of his people. We then have the song, Alleluia, again. We then have the sermon, which allows the archbishop to address their majesties, the congregation, and those participating elsewhere, drawing and contextualising what we have already seen and setting out the themes and desires of the coronation and how they relate not only to their majesties, but to all people. We then have the Come Creator Spirit, which follows the oaths and prayers that state and illuminate the unique demands of monarchy. In so doing, it recognises that such a calling can only be fulfilled with the sustaining strength and grace of God. So this ancient text became part of the coronation service in the 14th century. And today we hear it sung in a variety of languages associated with the United Kingdom. And it's in a new arrangement of the plain song tune. So the languages used are in traditional languages of the four nations that make up the United Kingdom. The use of languages from around the United Kingdom is a beautiful way to acknowledge the rich heritage of our country and these communities while demonstrating the importance of maintaining and preserving these languages. So then this, at this moment of the service, the Archbishop is presented and formally received the coronation oil. So the coronation oil has been created using olives harvested from two groves in the Mount of Olives at the monastery of Mary Magdalene and the Monastery of Ascension. So the Monastery of Mary Magdalene is the burial place of His Majesty's grandmother, Princess Alice of Greece, and the olives were pressed just outside Bethlehem. So the oil has been perfumed with essential oils like sesame, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, neroli, amber, orange blossom. And the Archbishop in Jerusalem is going to present the oil so it symbolically completes the oil's journey and helps emphasise the strong historic link between the coronation, the Old Testament and the Holy Land. And this is a newly composed prayer for the service, but it does remain faithful to the style of the Book of Common Prayer. So we then become to the part of the service called the anointing. So as the king prepares to be anointed upon the coronation chair, he removes the robes of state. The king's anointing sets him apart to fulfil a vocation and begin a new life as sovereign, dedicated to the service of all. So he will wear a simple white plain gown. You can see the one in which Queen Elizabeth II wore in 1953. So the gown is austere and plain. So it symbolises divesting oneself of all worldly vanity to stand bare before God. The anointing is a very sacred 
and private part of the ceremony. So this will happen behind a screen, which has been specially commissioned. And as you can see, this is a glimpse of it. So it's a tree and it's got 56 leaves with all the nations represented on it. Really beautiful. So that will be a very private, special moment between Sovereign and God. So the coronation chair was made by order of King Edward I and been part of coronation services in the Abbey since 1399. Um, it's designed to hold the Stone of Scone, which is the ancient scone on which the kings of Scotland were inaugurated. So since 1996, the stone's been kept at Edinburgh Castle it's been returned to the Abbey for the coronation. Um, the placement of this Scottish so stone within the English coronation chair meant for the coronation with the consent of the Scottish government and people is an important symbol of unity and shared history and heritage between these nations. So as I said, the anointing is the most sacred part of the service using the ampulla and spoon, which is dated back to either Richard I or Henry II and the spoon, and then the ampulla was supplied for the coronation of King Charles II in 1661. So the spoon is actually the oldest part of the whole ceremony that still survives. So the king is anointed in the sleeveless linen tunic, showing that he's an anointed under God and stands humbly and simply, ready to begin a new dedicated life of service. He then is vested with this super tunica, an embroidered gold coat. So the super tunica is the one robe that's passed down by monarchs, and it's a full length sleeve coat of gold silk. And it's been worn by King George V, VI and Queen Elizabeth II. We then come on to the exciting part, the presentation of the regalia, okay? And some of these will be presented by peers from non-Christian faith traditions, which I really think shows that His Majesty is invested in all people and not just the Christian church. So we start off with the spurs. So the spurs were made in 1661 for King Charles II, but they date back to all coronations, dating back to King Richard I and his coronation in 1189. Then during the exchange of the swords, we have a psalm, which has been specially commissioned to reflect His Majesty's paternal heritage. So the Duke of Edinburgh was born a Prince of Greece. And so the Greek choir were invited to remind His Majesty of his father's influence and dedicated service to the late Queen. I think that's a really nice touch. And then we come on to the jeweled sword being presented. So this will be the first time that the sword will be carried and presented by a woman. The jewelled sword was made in 1820, has a steel blade mounted in gold and set with jewels, which form a rose, a thistle, a shamrock, oak leaves, acorns and lion's heads. And it was first used for the coronation of George IV. So the jewelled sword is a visual representation of the meaning and symbolism of the other swords on display. So the sword of state, sword of spiritual justice, and the sword of mercy. So swords in this context are not used as violent weapons, but are an ancient symbol of authority and justice, being served quickly and mercifully. Justice and peace are inextricably linked. We then move on to the armils being uh, presented. So these have deep echoes of coronations back to the time of King Solomon and they are a bond uniting the sovereign to the people. 
and the armils bear symbolism about the protection that God gives. We then continue to be for the robe royal and the stole royal to be presented. So a new stole has been commissioned for the coronation. And the, the robe royal is embroidered with nation symbols and imperial eagles crafted in silver thread. We then have the orb being presented. So the orb is a representation of the sovereign's power and symbolising the world under the cross of Christ. So it's made in the 17th century and divided into three sections with bands of jewels for each of the three continents thought to exist at that period of time. The sovereign's ring will then be the next thing to be presented to his majesty. So the ring is a symbol of promise and commitment. They, sig they signify covenant and agreement and unbroken bond without end marries the king to God in duty and to the people in loving service. In turn, it acts to assure his majesty of God's unfailing love. The king will then be presented with a glove, which he will place on his right hand. So the glove is a demonstration of the sovereign as advocate and challenger for the protection and honour of the people. Also bears a second meaning as a reminder of holding power Symbolised in the sceptre, gently in a gloved hand. As you can see, this is the late Queen's coronation glove. So the sovereign sceptre across represents the sovereign's temporal power with authority. It is associated with good governance, which is to be exercised wisely, hence the gloved hand in which the king holds it. The sovereign sceptre with dove, traditionally known as the rod of equity and mercy, represents the sovereign's spiritual role. The enamelled dove with outspread wings, representing the Holy Spirit and the monarch's pastoral care for the people. We then get to a very exciting part, the crowning. So St Edward's crown was made for the coronation of Charles II in 1661. Because the previous one was melted down, it's made of solid gold set with precious stones. And though it's valuable beyond earthly price, it nevertheless is surmounted with a cross, a reminder that Jesus gave his life for us. So the crown signifies more than kingly dignity, but also costly sacrifice, the sacrifice of love. And it's a visible symbol of one who has been anointed before God for this purpose and this service to the nation. So it's representing the king's vocation before God. It's a constant reminder of the promises and vows he has made to the people and of the virtues of the crown, demonstrated by its own crafted symbolism that the king will strive to embody every day. So it's a moment of joy and celebration when past, present and future are interlinked and cries of God save the king became part of this service at this point in 1689 and have remained ever since. It's quite a heavy crown at around five pounds. We'll then have a fanfare where the abbey bells will ring for two minutes and there'll be gun salutes, um, which will be fired at, at the Tower of London and all across the United Kingdom, Gibraltar, Bermuda and ships at sea. There follows a blessing, and in the progress of humanical relations since 1953, it means that for the first time, the blessing is to be shared by Christian leaders across the country. So that's really great to see. We then have an anthem, and then the enthroning the king. So this is a moment which recalls the past through its historic significance, but also establishes the present reign and looks forward with eternal hope through the prayer of blessing. There then follows oaths of allegiance, which have always been sworn to the newly anointed and crowned sovereign. So we've got the homage to the Church of England by the Archbishop, and then by the heir, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. And then we'll have the homage of the people, which is a newly created for this 
coronation. So the Archbishop will invite those who wish from the United Kingdom and the other realms, both within the Abbey and those watching and listening at home, to make the homage by sharing the same words, so that a chorus of, chorus of millions of voices will be enabled for the first time in history to participate in this solemn and joyful moment. So this is a new and significant moment in the tradition of the coronation. Never before in our history has the general public been offered an opportunity to join with national uh, figures in declaring their allegiance to a new sovereign. We then carry on to an anthem, which was written for the coronation of King George V. And then we move on to the coronation of the Queen. So it's slight, it's similar to the sovereign, but slightly different. So the crowning of a consort is a ceremony and it last seen in 1937 with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. And it's a ceremony which is only conferred upon female consorts, hence why we didn't see Prince Philip being crowned as a consort. So the Queen is anointed by the Archbishop, but this will happen without a screen or canopy to demonstrate the different nature of the anointing a consort compared to the reigning monarch, as the anointing is at the permission of the sovereign in this case. So the Queen consort will then receive a ring like the King did. So the ring marries consort to the king and then both to God in duty and to the people in loving service and in turn acts as an, ensure, as a, an assurance of God's unfailing love. So this ring was created for the coronation of King William IV to Queen Adelaide in 1831 and the ring was being used by Queen Alexandra, Queen Mary and Elizabeth the Queen Mother. We then have the Queen being crowned. So the Queen is being crowned with Queen Mary's crown. It's undergone minor changes and additions include the Cullion 3, 4 and 5 diamonds, which were part of Her Late Majesty's personal jewellery collection. So I think that's a really lovely touch there. So the Queen is also presented with a scepter and rod. And it acknowledges the responsibilities of such an undertaking. She commits herself to a life of service in support of her husband and her sovereign. We then have a song with a setting of verses from Psalm 98 has been commissioned for this service. And this is the moment in which the king and the queen are united in their joint vocation before God. She too is set apart and consecrated for service to the nation. We then have the offertory hymn, which is over a thousand years old and gifts of bread and wine are br brought before the king for him to acknowledge. There follows the prayer over the bread and wine. And this is followed by the Eucharistic prayer. And then this is followed again by Sanctus, and then another Eucharistic prayer continues. The Archbishop will then invite everybody to Say the Lord's Prayer, and then we have the Holy Communion. Then we continue to a prayer following the Communion. And then we'll move on to the final blessing by the Archbishop of Canterbury. We then have a sung hymn and an anthem which was created for the coronation of George III. We then have the final hymn of the church, which dates from the 4th century and has always been a part of the coronation rite. So during this part, their majesties will move into St Edward's Chapel and there they will be vested in the robes of estate, not to be confused with the robes of state that they arrived in, and His Majesty exchanges the St. Edward's crown for the imperial crown. So King Charles will wear the robe that George VI did for his 1937 coronation. And the Queen Consort has a new robe of estate 
which has been designed and hand embroidered by the Royal School of Needlework, which you can see here. So the train design is drawing on themes of nature and the environment and features the national emblems of the United Kingdom. So it's the first time insects including bees and a beetle feature on the coronation robe drawing on the themes of nature and the environment which reflects their majesty's affection for the natural world. Also there are a number of plants featured in the robe all chosen for their personal associations so you've got Lily the Valley, which featured in Her Majesty's Wedding Bouquet and was her favourite flower. Myrtle, which represents hope. Delphinium, one of King, the King's favourite flowers. And the birth flower of July, which is the birth month of the Queen Consort. And you've also got Lady's Mantle, which symbolises love and comfort. Maiden Hair Fern, which symbolises purity. And Cornflowers, which represent love and tenderness. The cornflower also helps to attract and encourage wildlife such as bees and butterflies. So I think that's a really beautiful symbolism on the new Queen Consort's robe of estate. So here is the Imperial State Crown, which replaces St Edward's Crown. and dates back to the 15th century when English monarchs chose a crown design closed by arches to demonstrate that England, and now the United Kingdom, was not subject to any earthly any other earthly power. So this particular crown um, was made for the coronation of King George VI in 1937, but is closely based on a crown designed for Queen Victoria's coronation. We then have the national anthem, God Save Our Gracious King. Just getting used to, still getting used to saying King. <laughs> And that's been our national anthem for more than 250 years. God Save the King is both anthem and prayer, invoking God to spare and protect the sovereign to ensure good governance. And the phrase is much older than the song, appearing, for instance, several times in the King James Bible. We then have the King's outward procession. And then finally, we have the greeting of faith leaders and representatives. So this is an unprecedented gesture consolidating the significance of the religious diversity of the realms. So the sovereign will take his final moments to receive greetings from the leaders and representatives from major non-Christian faith traditions, which I think is really, really important these days. So in a spoken greeting, these faith leaders and representatives speak with their own voices as communities, but deliver the greeting in unison as a community of faiths united in the service of others, and in thanksgiving of his majesty's example this day and every day of his reign. So I think that's really a lovely way to finish this service. So from there, their majesties will be part of the coronation procession, back up Whitehall, back up the Mall to Buckingham Palace for the balcony Scene. In a change from tradition, the, their majesties will be using the Diamond State Coach, a Diamond Jubilee State Coach, um, which was commissioned for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee on the way to Westminster Abbey. And on their way back, they'll be using the traditional Gold State Coach, which was first used by King George III in 1760. Apparently, it's extremely uncomfortable. And then this will conclude with a fly past. So the working members, royal members of the royal family will be on the balcony. And there will be the fly past. I believe that's going to be about 2.30 with the coronation ceremony starting at 11am. And I think that will be quite a sight to behold. Very exciting now.